Hey, welcome back to part two of recapping Percy Jackson for you guys. Today we're going to be talking about the Sea of Monsters. I'm so excited to talk about this one. So if you guys missed the first video, I went through the entire plot of The Lightning Thief. So if you haven't checked that out, please do so. That was a ton of fun for me to do. And we are going to be doing the other three books as well. Those are going to be coming later. So keep an eye out for those. If you don't want to miss them, make sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss an upload from me. Before we get started, I wanted to say that the majority of the art that I am using for this video is done by Victoria Rydell. She has done the official art for this series, which you can find on Rick Riordan's website. Um, this is what majority of the art that I have used for. Here are some examples of that. Um, so the majority of the pictures of characters that I have used are fan art done by her. If it's not by her, there is some from the graphic novel series, which is done by John Rocco also fantastic. Um, so here are a couple examples of that. And finally, if there isn't official art or if I didn't want to use the graphic art, uh, graphic novel art, I just found pictures from either the god-awful movies or just other characters that I think represent these characters. So that is what I have done for this. I hope you guys like it. It's the best that I could come up with. And once again, shout out to Mike's Mike and Carrie Can Read for making series like this before that have inspired me to do this for this series. And without further ado, let's just get into it. Once again, I have my trusty iPad here, so that's what we're going to be using to talk about this because I cannot remember all of the things that have happened in this series all the way up here. I'd forget a million important details and we don't want to do that. So we got this. <laughs> all right, we got to go over the best chapter titles for this book, of course. So we have I Play Dodgeball with Cannibals, We Hail the Taxi of Eternal Torment, and We Meet the Sheep of Doom. Those are my three favorites. So first thing we open on, Percy is having another nightmare. We are already jumping in. This time he's in Florida, which is a nightmare inducing place. Um, which he just knows that he's in Florida, despite there's like no signs, no nothing. He's just like, oh, I'm in Florida. And he's never been to Florida either, mind you. He says he's never been to Florida, so I don't know how he knows, but he's in Florida. Um, he spots Grover, who is running for his life, and he looks terrified. <laughs> there is like a storm going on, and Percy can hear something like roar from behind Grover, and Grover is able to get inside of a bridal boutique apparently, and he is hiding, and he's muttering something about having to warn them, whatever that means, and then Percy wakes up. So when he wakes up, he's like looking out his window, and he sees this like figure, like this like shadowy like figure that kind of looks like a person, but it like disappears really quickly, um, and it's like mom knocks on the door at like the same time, so he doesn't have time to think about that. It is Percy's last day of school. He has almost made it throughout the entire school year, which is quite the achievement for him. Usually he gets expelled before that happens. Sally has made him breakfast, but when he like talks about going to camp since school is over, that means it's summer so he can go back to camp, she like gets really quiet and she like tries to change the topic. She brings up Percy and his new friend Tyson. She's like, oh, I can take you guys to that skate shop that you guys like after school. And Percy can tell that his mom's like hiding something from him. He knows that she is not telling him something. And eventually she breaks and she's like, Chiron sent me a letter and he thinks it's best if we postpone you coming to camp for a little bit. And Percy's like, what the heck? Why would I postpone going to camp? But there isn't much time to talk about it because he's going to be late for school. So he leaves and once he's outside, he thinks he sees that like shadowy figure again, but he like Again, it disappears before he can like do anything about it. So I'm gonna breeze through this section at school a little bit because it's not super important, but the most important thing to know is about Tyson. Tyson was the only homeless kid at Meriwether College Prep. As near as my mom and I could figure, he'd been abandoned by his parents when he was very young, probably because he was so different. He was six foot three and built like the abominable snowman, but he cried a lot and was scared of just about everything, including his own reflection. His face was kind of misshapen and brutal looking. I couldn't tell you what color his eyes were because I could never make myself look past look higher than his crooked teeth. His voice was deep, but he talked funny, like a much younger kid, I guess because he'd never gone to school before coming to Meriwether. 
He wore tattered jeans, grimy size 20 sneakers, and a plaid flannel shirt with holes in it. He smelled like a New York City alleyway because that's where he lived, in a cardboard refrigerator box off 72nd Street. So, Percy and Tyson have become friends, and Percy spends most of his time at school defending Tyson from the other students, most specifically this one bully named Matt Sloan. So, at one point, Percy is, like, looking at this picture that he has in his notebook, and the picture is of Annabeth in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. on a vacation, and she had, like, emailed the picture to Percy, and he had, like, printed it off, which is really sweet. <laughs> Sloan is really quick to tease Percy about this. He, like, grabs the picture out of his notebook and, like, hands it to this group, of like really 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 big dudes that are apparently there to like visit this school before coming next year um like these kids are supposed to be seventh graders and they certainly don't look like it they're huge like really really tall really really tall dudes so as percy's leaving that class he hears a girl whisper his name but when he looks around there's nobody there get to gym class and as a final the class is going to play dodgeball and sloan is on one team with all of the really big kids and everybody else including percy and tyson are on the other team tyson's not having a good time he keeps pointing at the new kids and is saying stuff about how they like smell funny which percy doesn't really seem to be picking up on this dodgeball game starts and these new kids are ridiculously strong and the way they're throwing these dodgeballs seems really deadly and then all of a sudden they start to like grow even bigger like they're even bigger than tyson at this point and one of them calls percy by his full name perseus jackson which nobody should know so this is not a good sign <laughs> so these new kids are definitely no longer kids they were eight foot tall giants with wild eyes pointy teeth and hairy arms tattooed with snakes and hula women and valentine's heart valentine hearts fun times. So these new kids have somehow gotten a hold of cannonballs instead of dodgeballs and are throwing those instead, which super deadly. If the way they were thrown in dodgeballs before was deadly, this is now super deadly because it's cannonballs. So it's quite clear at this point that these new kids are some sort of monsters, right? And Percy goes to reach for Riptide, which should be in his pocket, but he's wearing his gym clothes that don't have pockets, which means Riptide's in his pants in the locker room. So, Percy needs to always be wearing pants with pockets, is what we're learning. <laughs> so the monsters have locked the doors and blocked them off so he can't get into the locker room, which means he's kind of screwed. But Tyson jumps in front of him and somehow catches the cannonballs and starts throwing them back at the monsters, causing them to disintegrate into dust, meaning obviously monsters. So. Let's be clear about this though, Tyson should not have been able to do that. Nobody can catch a cannonball, like no. So it's not going super great. Tyson ends up kind of getting a cannonball to the chest and is like very dazed. And the last monster is about to like reach Percy when he suddenly stops turning to dust in front of him. And who is now standing in front of Percy? Annabeth. So the three of them get outside and Annabeth very angrily demands to know where Percy found Tyson. And Percy's like, he is my friend. We met at school. And Annabeth's just kind of being very rude to Tyson this entire time. Anyways, she reveals that those monsters are called Lastragonians or giant cannibals. And she ends up calling them Canadians as well, which doesn't quite seem to fit, but I guess they're from Canada. Annabeth then goes on to tell Percy that she's been having dreams about camp, like bad things are happening at camp, and she's like, hey, have you been having the same dreams? And he's like, no, I've been dreaming about Grover. And she's like, huh? But she moves on because there are more pressing issues right now. She's like, we need to get to camp fast, and I've had monsters on my tail all the way from Virginia. And she's like, have you been dealing with any attacks? And Percy's like, shockingly, no, I. this is the first time. And she is also shocked for a moment, but then she looks over at Tyson and she kind of seems to have like some realization, like something seems to hit her here. She points out to Percy that Tyson's hands aren't burnt when they definitely should be after catching and throwing several flaming cannonballs. And Percy's just kind of going through it right now. There is so much information being thrown at him all at once and he is having a hard time processing what's exactly happening. <laughs> Tyson's also kind of confused. He doesn't understand what's happening at all. So Percy gives him the briefest 
version of his and Annabeth's family lineages and lives. So Annabeth's getting pretty impatient and she's like, all right, we need to hail a taxi. We need to get to camp. And she pulls out one of the golden drachmas, which is like the currency for like the ancient Greek world and just throws it onto the pavement and it just disappears into the pavement. Sick. And then the ground like ripples and a taxi appears that looks like it's made out of smoke, which is cool. <laughs> Annabeth says the destination to the lady on the passenger side window and they are about to get in when she's like, we don't serve his kind and points to Tyson. Annabeth is quick being like, nope, we will give you more money on arrival and here's a little bit more to smooth that over. And that seems to do the trick. But Percy is still very confused about why everyone seems to have a problem with Tyson. He just doesn't seem to get it. Annabeth's having a problem. Now this lady in the taxi is having a problem. Mm. He just doesn't understand because Tyson's his friend. So they get in the taxi and it's not one old lady, but three really old withered ladies all sitting in the front. They start driving. It's absolutely horrible. They're going crazy. They're like weaving in and out of traffic. And Percy is convinced that out of all of the things that have attacked him, this is going to be the way that he goes. These ladies start talking about giving each other the eye and the tooth. And Annabeth's like, all right, these are the gray sisters. All three of them share a singular eye and a singular tooth. And their taxi service is the fastest in the area. Then these sisters mention something about the location that they seek. They referring to Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson. And Percy's like immediately interested because he's like, I didn't even know I was seeking a location. What are you talking about? Tell me now. <laughs> they quickly deny everything, but Percy is not having it. Their eye like drops and like rolls to the back seat and Percy like picks it up and holds it out the window and he's like, all right, you're gonna tell me this location? Oh, I'm throwing your eye into the river. <laughs> they end up giving Percy four numbers, 30, 31, 75, 12. And that's apparently enough because Percy gives the eye back and they've made it to Half Blood Hill. They reach the hill and look down at camp and things are not looking good because two mechanical fire-breathing bulls are attacking the camp. Clarice is leading the attack on them and Annabeth drags Percy to go and help her. And she tries to get Tyson to go with them, but Percy's like, nope, he is mortal. He is going to get fried. I'm not letting him do that. <laughs> Annabeth doesn't have time to argue with him. They need to go and help Clarice. So they start fighting the bulls, but at one point Percy like trips over something. I think it was like a tree root and messes up his ankle. And so he is kind of stuck in one spot. He's not really moving anywhere. So Annabeth calls for Tyson to like go and help Percy, but he can't th get through the border. So Annabeth like gives him permission and he like barrels down the hill, getting the bull out of the way before it can like flame royal Percy, but instead it flame broils Tyson, which means he should be dead, right? No, Tyson standing there completely fine. If Percy could be even more confused than he is now, he certainly would be after that. <laughs> so they're able to get both of the bulls gone and after the battle, Percy is trying to figure out everything and Annabeth is just like, look at Tyson really closely through the mist and that is when Percy sees it. Tyson only has one eye. He is a cyclops and cyclops are fireproof. So that is how Tyson survived the cannibals in the gym and the fire breathing bulls. This also explains why no monsters have attacked Percy all year because he's had a giant cyclops protecting him, essentially. Not on purpose, just he was there, so nobody attacked him. <laughs> so Clarice comes over and we learn that there's a new activities director at camp, Tantalus, which means Chiron is no longer activities director. We also learn that Argus, the guy with eyes, like eyes all over his body, got fired from being security director. So Clarice then points up to Thalia's pine tree and Percy can see that something is very wrong. I opened that right to the right page. <laughs> a sliver of ice ran through my chest. 
Now I understood why the camp was in danger. The magical borders were failing because Thalia's pine tree was dying. Someone had poisoned it. That's just so rude, bro. Who would poison a memorial tree? <laughs> so Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson make their way to Chiron's apartment and Percy kind of gives Tyson like a half-hearted tour along the way. He's really not into it, but Tyson's really curious. So luckily Chiron is still there packing up his stuff and Annabeth just kind of like breaks down when she sees him because she doesn't want him to leave. Um, and we find out that Chiron has taken the blame for what happened to Thalia's pine tree. And Zeus is apparently really pissed, but it's just, the whole situation's really unfair because obviously Chiron didn't do it, but he's taking the blame because nobody else will. He tells them that the tree only has a couple weeks left to live unless he doesn't finish the sentence. Of course, because no one can just give straight answers in this series. Obviously, Percy and Annabeth are interested in whatever could save the tree. Um, they're like demanding answers, but Chiron just kind of like shuts them down. I mean, like, nope, it's too dangerous. I'm not gonna let you guys do that. So clearly the poisoning of the tree was Cronus's doing, and there is a good chance that all of this is a trap. So it's not worth risking their lives like for this. So Chiron's like, Annabeth, you have to stay with Percy and remember the prophecy. What prophecy? Don't know exactly. We have an idea, but we don't know what it says. So Percy's like, is this the super dangerous prophecy about me that you're talking about? That I'm gonna like destroy the world? <laughs> and the other two don't answer. He's like, yep, just, just checking. Just wanted to make sure. So Chiron has to leave. And he makes Annabeth swear on the river sticks to do her best to keep Percy out of danger, which she does. Which we know is a tall, tall order because this dude finds trouble like nobody else. All right, I don't think I've explained this before, but swearing on the river sticks is like very, very binding. It's like the most binding anything can be. I think you die if you break a vow on the river sticks. Even This even applies to gods and stuff. So Percy, Annabeth, and Tyson make their way to the dining pavilion once they hear the conch horn that signals dinner. We get a brief introduction to all of the different cabin leaders. Clarice obviously leads the Ares cabin. We get the Hephaestus cabin being led by Charles Beckendorf. And the other cabins start to fill in until we get to the Hermes cabin, which is now being led by two brothers named Connor and Travis Stoll. Originally, it was being led by Luke, but he's an awful traitor now, so they needed a new head counselor. So now it's the two brothers. They're not twins, but they look about as close to twins as you can be without being twins. So now I get introduced to Tantalus, the new activities director. If you don't know, here's a little mythology lesson for ya. This dude invited the gods to a meal and ended up killing his children and putting them in the stew and the gods in return punished him in the field of punishment to stand in a river where he cannot drink the water and to be underneath an apple tree that is just out of reach so he is this close to food and water but he can never get it as punishment for feeding his children to the gods <laughs> terrifying <laughs> so mr d and tantalus are just kind of like taunting percy and just being com complete horrible people but they eventually dismiss him to his table and tell tyson to stay with them until they can figure out what to do with him because having a cyclops at camp is not really something that they've ever had before you know they're not usually good they're monsters essentially so they gotta figure out what to do with him so towards the end of the meal, Tantalus gets up to make an announcement saying that they are reinstating chariot races and the whole camp kind of like erupts in anger. Apparently chariot races did not go well the last time they went on and nobody really wants to do them. There were quote, three deaths and 26 mutilations. So yeah, I'm really not surprised they don't want those brought back. <laughs> Clarice then stands up and she's like, if all of us are focused on chariot races, how are we going to continue border patrol? And Tantalus is just like, don't worry about it. We don't need border patrol. Everything's 
fine. Tantalus then brings up Tyson and he's like, we'll keep him around and asked if like the Hermes cabin will take him in and the Stoll brothers like don't really say anything, like say anything. So they don't really have room in their cabin and it's not the best feeling to have a Cyclops in your cabin, I'm guessing. Just then, gasps can be heard as something appears over Tyson's head. A glowing green trident, the same one that appeared over Percy's head the year prior. Tyson is the son of Poseidon and Percy's brother. So, next few days are not so great for Percy. He really doesn't want to admit it, but he's pretty embarrassed about the whole Tyson thing. And he's starting to feel like being a son of Poseidon is now a joke when he felt like it was, when it was like really something to like be celebrated last summer. The other campers have started to treat him a little bit differently. Like he's gone from being the kid with the quest to the kid with a monster for a brother. So Annabeth suggests that they team up for the chariot race to kind of take Percy's mind off of a lot of things, um, both of their minds really, since they're really rest, both of them are really restless about Thalia's tree and that whole situation, but really there's nothing that they can do right now. Also, they would absolutely kill the chariot race because Athena created chariots and Poseidon created horses, so really it's their game to win. However, the two of them quickly get into an argument about Tyson and because Annabeth clearly has something against Cyclops is more than just the general their monsters thing. Clearly she's got something personal and she's taking it out on Tyson, but she's not telling Percy anything and she ends up just being like, well, if you like him so bad, work on the chariot race with him then, I'm leaving. And she leaves. So luckily for Tyson, Beckendorf, the leader of the Hephaestus cabin, does not seem to have any issues with him and Tyson spends a lot of time with him in the camp forges. Percy is honestly just trying to get through every day, shuffling through activities and just not having a good time at all because his mind is like continuously wandering back to Luke and Kronos and the whole thing is just making him very angry. That night he ends up having another dream about Grover, same kind of deal, nothing really new. So finally Tyson and Percy get a chance to talk and Tyson explains that he knows that he's a monster but he wants to be a good monster. Percy tells him that it's really tough for him because he's never had a brother before and there's just so many things going on right now that he is worried about and it's just a lot for him to deal with. So, third dream about Grover. This time he's wearing a wedding dress. Okay. Um, then he like starts talking to Percy and Percy's able to talk to him as well, which is weird. That's not really how dreams work. We hear a rumbling voice in the distance calling for Grover and when he responds, his voice like goes up several octaves. <laughs> he is able to tell Percy that he needs help, that he's on an island, and that he is trapped. Grover turned back to me. You have to help me. No time. I'm stuck in this cave on an island in the sea. Where? I don't know exactly. I went to Florida and turned left. What? How did you- It's a trap, Grover said. It's the reason no Zader has ever returned from this quest. He's a shepherd, Percy, and he has it. Its nature magic is so powerful, it smells just like the great god Pan. The Zaders come here thinking they found Pan, and they get trapped and eaten by Polyphemus. Poly who? The Cyclops, Grover said, exasperated. I almost got away. I made it all the way to St. Augustine. But he followed you, I remembered. But he followed you, I said, remembering my first dream, and trapped you in a bridal boutique. That's right, Grover said. My first empathy link. Must have worked. Look, this bridal dress is the only thing keeping me alive. He thinks I smell good, but I told him it was goat-scented perfume. Thank goodness he can't see very well. His eye is still half blind from the last time somebody poked it out, but soon he'll realize what I am. He's only giving me two weeks to finish the bridal train, and he's getting impatient. Wait a minute, the Cyclops thinks you're- a Yes, Grover World, he thinks I'm a lady Cyclops and he wants to marry me. Under different circumstances, I might have busted out laughing, but Grover's voice was deadly serious. He was shaking with fear. I'll come rescue you, I promised. Where are you? The Sea of Monsters, of course. So this empathy link that Grover has mentioned basically kind of like connects their minds and allows them to talk to one another. It's kind of like a weird situation where it's like, it's not really a if you die, I die kind of thing, but if it's a if you die, things might not be great up here for the other person. <laughs> not great, but Grover needed to do it so he could get a message out to Percy. So now it's race day. Tantalus is like, don't kill anyone or there will be harsh punishments, aka no 
s'mores at the campfire for an entire week. Oh no. Kill someone. No s'mores. So Percy tries to tell Annabeth about his dream because it's like obviously super important, but she isn't really having it because she's like, you're just trying to distract me. We can talk about this later if it's still that important. <laughs> so the race starts, it's going pretty okay, but this large swarm of birds appears in the sky out of nowhere and they start diving on everyone, the people in the race, the people in the stands and are like, furiously pecking at these people. <laughs> these are the Stymphalian birds and they will supposedly peck people to death, peck them down to their bones if they are not stopped. They also just screech really loudly and are super annoying. So nobody likes that, right? Nobody. Hercules apparently fought these before and had defeated them using really loud brass bells. Great. Not really something people tend to have on hand though. So, Annabeth and Percy are trying to come up with something when Annabeth's eyes go wide. Chiron apparently had a really large collection of really bad Dean Martin CDs. So they make a run for the big house and are able to get that, bringing it back to the track. And in the meantime, Clarice has like crossed the finish line, but nobody's paying attention because why would they be there being attacked? Obviously they're not paying attention. Luckily the music ends up working and it stuns the birds for long enough for the Apollo kids to shoot them down or for them to just fly away. Tantalus is not happy because he is convinced that Percy and Annabeth disrupted the race on their own. <laughs> yeah, I hate this guy. Um, they are forced to clean dishes after dinner, but apparently the cleaning harpies that work at the camp clean the dishes using lava. So they have to wear special gloves as to not melt their hands off, but Tyson also got punished and he's just having the time of his life. He's using the uh, kind of molten metal of the um, silverware to form little boats. He's having a great time. So this does give Percy and Annabeth some time to talk though. And Annabeth is really thinking about this thing that Grover has supposedly found. She finally explains it to Percy. It's the golden fleece the same one that the hero Jason had found. It can heal anything it touches, and if Grover is there, everything is just kind of seeming to line up a little bit too perfectly like it's a trap. The fleece could heal Thalia's tree, it could save the camp, and they could save Grover all in one go. It just seems a little bit too perfect. Annabeth is kind of hesitant to do this because they'd have to go through the Sea of Monsters, which is super dangerous, but Percy's able to convince her though, and they make a plan to ask Tantalus for a quest at the campfire that night. It goes just about as well as anyone would expect. Tantalus outright denies that anything is wrong and that the camp needs saving in the first place, but eventually he comes around to it and says there will be a quest, but decides to assign it to Clarice instead. Needless to say, Percy and Annabeth are pissed because they were the one that brought the idea to him in the first place. So that night, Percy breaks curfew, heads down to the beach to think, and he doesn't get long as he's interrupted by someone running on the beach. And he's pretty confused because nobody but the campers should be able to get in. And this dude's obviously not a camper. So the dude's like, hey, can I sit down and join you? And he takes one of the Cokes that Percy has and answers a call. And Percy can see on his phone that there's like these two snakes wrapped around his phone and the dude ends up introducing them as George and Martha. <laughs> They've got names. His phone then transforms into its original form, which is a staff with wings and two snakes coiled at the top. The man is none other than Hermes. He tells Percy that he thinks he should go on the quest and ends up giving him two gifts. So one of them is a thermos from the show Hercules Busts Heads, which actually is something from the books. It wasn't made up in the movies which serves as both a compass and when opened, it unleashes winds from the four corners of the earth. The second gift is a bottle of gummy vitamins that he says will make him feel like himself again, but to only use them when absolutely necessary. Percy asks Hermes like, hey, why are you doing all of this for me? And Hermes like, I really hope that you can maybe talk Luke and kind of get him to see reason because <laughs> he obviously won't listen to me but he might listen to you. Percy's like 
I would love to, but I don't really think that's possible. I think he's a little bit too far gone now. And Hermes is like, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that you can't give up on family. So Hermes ends up also giving Percy three different duffel bags and says that he needs to decide soon his friends are going to be here any minute. He's like, hey, if you ask your father nicely, he might be able to give you a ride to that ship over there and points to a cruise ship that is just sailing through Long Island Sound. Okay. He leaves and Percy sees Annoth and Titson running over the hills, calling his name, and Percy's like, all right, I gotta do this. We gotta go on this quest, even though we're not granted a quest. We gotta go. Annabeth's like, of course I'm going with you. Why wouldn't I be going with you? And she eventually agrees that Tyson it should go as well. It's mostly because if he stayed, Tantalus would obviously punish him for Percy and Annabeth leaving. So Percy reaches out to his dad, asks for help, and after a little while, we see what Tyson describes as fish ponies, like swimming through the ocean to greet them. These are hippocampi, which are creatures with the heads of horses and the bodies of fish. And they get there just in time because they can hear the cleaning harpies coming to get them for breaking curfew in the distance. So they get on the hippocampi and ride out to the cruise ship. It's named the Princess Andromeda. And once they get on board, Tyson's having a horrible time. He's saying that everything smells really bad, which I feel like we should be trusting Tyson's nose here. He was right about the giants in the gymnasium. So I feel like we should be trusting him. They end up finding a room to crash in and hide and just fall asleep. Percy dreams of Tartarus for the first time in a while, but is soon brought back to Grover. Not much new here. Grover's just like, hurry please. I need you here. So they wake up the next morning and everything on the ship is very weird because the passengers seem to be in like some sort of trance. The trio has to hide really quickly when they hear a sort of like reptilian voice as well as one that they recognize very well. Luke. They decide to follow him and on the way they also recognize another voice. Chris Rodriguez, a camper from the Hermes cabin that had disappeared after last summer. So the further they go, the more and more monsters they begin seeing, and it's honestly really starting to freak them out. They reach a cabin and Tyson says there's voices inside. And before Percy can do anything, Tyson starts to mimic the voices with like scary accuracy, which terrifies Annabeth, who is like trying to get him to stop, but it's too late. I just had time to say run when the doors of the stateroom burst open and there was Luke, flanked by two hairy giants armed with javelins, their bronze tips aimed at, right at our chests. Well, Luke said with a crooked grin, if it isn't my two favorite cousins, come right in. For going to be technical, Percy's his uncle. Hermes is the son of Zeus. So that would make Percy Luke's uncle, not cousin. Annabeth, though, is his cousin. True, that is true. They don't get into the technicalities of how everyone's technically related of the campers. They talk about it later on, but it's more just a nothing's really weird unless you're have like the same godly parent as someone else. That's the only time things get weird. So, yeah. I don't explain that till later, but I wanted to bring that up here. So Luke brings them inside to talk and pretty easily confesses to poisoning Thalia's tree and Annabeth is just appalled. You poisoned Thalia's tree? Luke said, right to the point, huh? Okay, sure. I poisoned the tree. So what? How could you? Annabeth sounded so angry I thought she'd explode. Thalia saves your life. Our lives. How could you dishonor her? I didn't dishonor her. Luke snapped. The gods dishonored her, Annabeth. If Thalia were alive, she'd be on my side. A liar. If you knew what was coming, you'd understand. I understand you want to destroy the camp, she yelled. You're a monster. Hmm. Interesting. Things are a little tense between the two people that seemed so close before. Hmm. <laughs> so Luke then goes off for a moment, saying that if there's anyone that's disrespecting Thalia's legacy, it's Annabeth for traveling with him and points to Tyson. 
Luke continues to try to turn the heroes to his side, feeding mostly on Percy's insecurities about his father, which I've honestly just significantly grown because of the whole Tyson situation. There seems to be a fight when Percy cuts in that Luke's father sent them, which was clearly not the right thing to say <laughs> because it only makes Luke angrier. Luke then points to a golden sarcophagus that is sitting behind him and tells the others that he is reforming. It's only a matter of time and everyone that joins their cause only allows him to grow stronger. So when it's clear that Percy and Annabeth are not going to be joining his cause, he sends them away to be eaten by the dragon that they keep downstairs. Okay, interesting. So luckily for the trio, they're on a cruise ship and somebody has water powers. Percy's able to cause a distraction and get the monster leading them away from them and the trio are able to get to a lifeboat. They use the thermos to propel it away from the ship as fast as possible and they sail off into the ocean. And as they travel, they're able to iris message Chiron and fill him in on the details. So soon they pass a sign for Virginia Beach, which surprises them because they've only been traveling for like one night, but somehow the Princess Andromeda just has that ability to travel really fast over long distances in a short amount of time. Percy is then able to tell them exactly how far they traveled in nautical miles, which we figure out is a Poseidon kid thing. He's just really good with sea travel. <laughs> However, it's three kids in a lifeboat and the Coast Guard has caught on to them. So Annabeth directs Percy to a place where they can like lay low for a moment. It's this like little cave that is stocked with supplies that apparently Annabeth, Luke, and Thalia had made while they were traveling. Once again, Tyson's not having a good time and we're on to time number three, people. I feel like we need to trust him. Listen to him when he says he's not having a good time. Percy ends up sending him out to find food, you know, powdered donuts or something. Literally his words. Percy and Annabeth talk for a little bit and they're really just trying to figure out what Luke's playing at here. Clearly there is some sort of trap there involved with the fleece, but the best they can figure out is that Luke is using them to get the fleece so he doesn't have to go and deal with Polyphemus. So Tyson then comes back and he's holding a box of powdered donuts. And he's like, yeah, there was a monster donut shop down the hill. And Anna's like, oh no, this is really bad. But sure enough, there is a donut shop there, right where Tyson said it was. And Percy is like, Annabeth, this is fine. We see these all over New York. It's a chain. But she's like, no, this is a nest for a very specific type of monster. And then they hear something behind them. No sudden moves. Annabeth said like her life depended on it. Very slowly, turn around. Then I heard it, a scraping noise, like something large dragging its belly through the leaves. I turned and saw a rhino-sized thing moving through the shadows of the trees. It was hissing, its front half writhing in all different directions. I couldn't understand what I was seeing at first. Then I realized the thing had multiple necks, at least seven, each topped with a hissing reptilian head. Its skin was leathery, and under each neck it wore a plastic bib that read, I'm a monster donut kid. It is the Hydra in case that wasn't clear enough. So Percy, being the brave hero that he is, jumps into battle and rather quickly just slices one of the Hydra's head off, which I feel like he should know what to do with the Hydra. You know, he's a hero, but apparently not, uh, it just doesn't click. Annabeth is yelling at him to stop, um, but Percy's kind of like running on adrenaline. He's just like, all right, I was angry about the Luke thing. I'm ready, let's go, slice. She gets him to stop and the Hydra is now chasing after them, but just then they hear this chugging noise behind them and spot what looks like a really old battleship coming towards them. And from atop the ship, they can hear a all too familiar voice, Clarice. She is able to shoot the Hydra with like cannonballs, killing it and causing it to burst into green goo. Amazing. She ends up helping the rest of the heroes aboard the ship rather begrudgingly and explained that they are in so much trouble. Tantalus expelled them for life. 
And she also explains that the ship was a gift from her father along with a crew of soldiers who were indebted to Ares. She went on a quest by herself, which normally you take two other people with you, because she wanted her cabin mates to stay behind and protect the camp. So despite the fact that there are two people there already that could go with her, minus Tyson if we don't want to count him, she's like, no, I am doing this on my own. It's my quest. So Percy's able to get some sleep, dreams of Grover again, and Polyphemus has taken Grover out to see the Golden Fleece and is demanding that the wedding take place tomorrow, which wouldn't be good. Grover asks something about like, hey, this island's pretty safe, right? Like what would happen if someone like attacked it? And Polyphemus like reassures him that they're completely fine and that he's got a state of the art security system, AKA his pets. Percy wakes up to alarms blaring as they have finally reached the Sea of Monsters. Guarding the entrance to the sea are two different monsters, Charybdis in the sea and Scylla on the rocky cliffs nearby. Going through Charybdis is just suicide, but going around her would mean being close enough where Scylla could just snap you up and eat you. So either way, not a good option. Percy's like, well, what if we went below deck? But that wouldn't work. So Clarice is like, all right, we're gonna go at Charybdis, shoot her with the cannonballs. So that's what they do, because it seems like the only good option right now. Percy has a really bad feeling about this, and Annabeth's like, can you control the water? And he's like, no, there's something stopping me. Things are not going as planned. The boiler room is overheating and the ship is about to blow, but Tyson's like, I got it, I can handle it. So he goes below deck and is able to kind of hold the engine together to keep it from blowing everybody up. So Charybdis is creating this kind of like whirlpool danger zone around her, but suddenly she stops sucking in the water around her, causing everything to go still. But then she opens her mouth and everything that she's ever taken in just gets thrown right back out at the ship, including the cannonballs, which several of them hit the ship. The ship gets pushed back right towards the rocky cliffs where Scylla is. And now the engine is threatening to blow. Tyson is still down there, somehow holding it together, but everyone needs to abandon ship. There's no way they're getting out of this alive. So Annabeth is trying to pull Percy to the lifeboats, but he's like, I don't want to leave Tyson. And he ends up giving her the thermos and runs down to the engine determined to get Tyson so all three of them can escape. But he doesn't get the chance as Scylla picks him up by his backpack he is able to like stab her in the eye with his sword, which stuns her enough to drop him right as the ship is exploding. Luckily, the lifeboats have gotten far enough, but Percy ends up hitting his head on something and like blacking out. Percy wakes up in a lifeboat with Annabeth and he immediately asks about Tyson, to which Annabeth just shakes her head. She had managed to get a few supplies from the wreckage, but not much. The thermos is now empty, so they were relying on this makeshift sail that she had made. Soon, the topic then turns to the prophecy that Chiron had mentioned, the one that Annabeth knows about that pertains to Percy. He is like, hey, you want to tell me about that? And she keeps saying that it really isn't good for people to know their future. But Percy's able to kind of figure out some things about it. The gods are worried about something I'll do when I get older, I guess something when I turn 16. Annabeth puts her Yankees cap in her hands. Percy, I don't know the full prophecy, but it warns about a half-blood child of the big three, the next one who lives to the age of 16. That's the real reason Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades swore a pact after World War II to not have any more kids. The next child of the big three who reaches 16 will be a dangerous weapon. Why? Because that hero will decide the fate of Olympus. He or she will make a decision that either saves the age of the gods, or destroys it. Ooh, dangerous. So they don't get much more time to talk about this though because Annabeth spots land in the distance. They make it to that said land and there is a lady with a clipboard waiting for them. Percy makes note of all the different ships that are docked in the harbor there, including a US Navy submarine, a three-masted sailing ship, a Channel 5 news helicopter, and a fighter jet that looks straight out of World War II. Interesting combination. The lady makes a note that this is their first time at the spot and says that Cece will want to talk to them personally. 
whoever CC is. The lady with the clipboard introduces them to CC and CC sends Annabeth off saying that she's gonna work on Percy herself. She shows him this perfected version of himself in a mirror, then gives him a drink that says that will turn him into that perfected version. However, when Percy drinks said drink, he finds himself shrinking until he is turned into a guinea pig. What the heck? Crazy. So Annabeth comes back not long after and quickly asks like, hey, where the heck's Percy? And Cece is just like, don't worry about it, asking Annabeth instead to stay on the island and study magic with her. This is where Annabeth figures out that Cece is not this woman's real name. She is the magician Cersei. Annabeth once again is like, hey, where is Percy? And Cersei's like, I just helped him recognize his true self before revealing the cage of guinea pigs that Percy is into her. There's a ton of other ones, assumedly all other men, that Cece has turned into guinea pigs. Annabeth asks for a moment alone to say goodbye to Percy, and Cersei's like, sure, why the heck not? So, once she's gone, Annabeth figures out which of the guinea pigs is Percy before finding the bottle of gummy vitamins that Hermes had given him. Cersei bursts into the room then, but Annabeth has already eaten a vitamin and Cersei's magic no longer has any effect on her. She then empties the rest of the bottle into the cage of guinea pigs. Percy eats one, as do all the other ones, other guinea pigs, and suddenly it's all a bunch of fully grown men and Percy in the room, which isn't great for Cersei. So two of them make a run for the exit and decide to take the pirate ship as their escape vessel. And they get on board and suddenly this like word comes to Percy's mind. And when he says that word, the ship starts like getting himself, like getting itself ready to sail. And they're able to sail away from the island on a pirate ship with just the two of them. Sick. The ship is like responding to Percy's every command and he's having a pretty fun time. He's enjoying himself. He's like, oh, this is really cool. It's like a fun new power that a Poseidon kid has that he didn't know about. All right, Percy and Annabeth talk again, and Percy figures out that the reason that Annabeth hates Cyclopes is because it's got something to do with how Thalia died. She tells him that on the way to camp, they found themselves in a Cyclops' den in Brooklyn. This specific Cyclops had it captured Luke, Thalia, and Grover, and was now taunting Annabeth with her dad's voice and her friend's voices the same way that Tyson was mimicking voices on the Princess Andromeda, which is why that freaked her out so much. Annabeth was able to stab him in the foot though, giving her enough time to free Thalia, who was able to take the Cyclops down and allowing the group to escape. But Annabeth still has nightmares about that to this day and she thinks that if they hadn't gotten turned around and stuck in that Cyclops' den, Thalia might still be alive. So that night, Percy dreams of Cronus's golden sarcophagus, and there's also a girl next to him that seems very familiar, but that he can't quite place. I looked over expecting to see Annabeth, but the girl wasn't Annabeth. She wore punk style clothes and silver chains on her wrists. She had spiky black hair and dark eyeliner around her stormy blue eyes and a spray of freckles across her nose. She looked familiar, but I wasn't sure why. This certainly sounds familiar to another girl Percy had a dream about in the last book, except her eyes are blue this time. They were always meant to be blue. They were never green. I don't know why they were green. Ugh. The girl asks if Percy's gonna do anything before she approaches the sarcophagus and Kronos only laughs before the sarcophagus engulfs, engulfs the girl in golden light. Annabeth then wakes Percy up and tells him that they're approaching the island of the Sirens. She wants to hear their song because it like, is supposed to reveal important information, but asks Percy to tie her up so she can escape and like die going to the Sirens. And Percy agrees tying her to one of the masts of the ship before stuffing candle wax in his ears so he can't hear anything. So as they are sailing by, Annabeth's like straining against the ropes before looking at Percy, pleading with him to let her go. He ends up looking away from her because it's too much. He's like, if I keep looking at her, I am going to free her, which we don't want to happen. When he turns back, she is gone. He had apparently forgotten to disarm her. She still had her knife on her. Percy dives into the water, swimming after her, 
And on the island, he can see like the sirens' faces morphing into those of his friends and family. And it's really tempting, but he's able to resist because he can see that the rest of them doesn't look like his family and friends. It looks like some weird monster. He reaches Annabeth and the moment that he touches her, he can see what she must be seeing. A family is sitting on a blanket in the park with a newly designed New York behind them. He figures out that it's Annabeth, her dad, Athena, and Luke. And Annabeth must have been the one that designed the city behind them. Everything is peaceful and happy. He is able to snap out of the vision and wills the current to bring them further out to sea. And it's like straining against him and he eventually pulls her underwater, creating like an air bubble so that they don't drown. And that's able to snap her out of the siren's control. So once they are far enough away, she just starts sobbing. So Percy just stays underwater with her and holds her and the fish have even started to watch which I just think is funny. So once they get back onto the ship and out of the siren's range, Annabeth explains that the sirens showed her her fatal flaw, which is hubris or deadly pride. Essentially, it's thinking that you can do things better than everybody else. She goes on to explain that every hero has a fatal flaw and if they don't learn to control it, well, it's not called fatal for nothing. <laughs> just then, a realization seems to hit them and Percy's nautical senses confirm it. They have reached 31 degrees, 31 minutes north, 75 degrees, 12 minutes west. These are the same numbers that the Grey Sisters had told them, and they have finally reached the island of Polyphemus. So the island is beautiful other than a scary rope bridge across a chasm. That's not great. They can just feel the fleece's energy radiating from this place. They eventually spot it hanging from a branch of a tree and seemingly there's nothing guarding it. They're kind of questioning this thinking that, oh my gosh, that's way too easy, right? When a deer emerges from the bushes and all of the sheep in the surrounding area rush the animal. It happened so fast that the deer stumbled and was lost in a sea of wool and trampling hooves. Grass and tufts of fur flew into the air. A second later, the sheep all moved away back to their regular peaceful wanderings. Where the deer had been was a pile of clean white bones. So that's the security system Polyphemus was talking about, in case it wasn't clear. So after this, Annabeth points out a lifeboat that is on the beach, and it is one of the lifeboats from Clarice's ship. Percy and Annabeth are able to bring their little pirate ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, to the back of the island where the cliffs are like super tall. And once they reach the top of the cliffs, they can hear voices from down below. Clarice is there challenging Polyphemus, who is just ignoring her and musing about the wedding. When Polyphemus says that he isn't marrying Clarice, she's like, wait, do you mean you're marrying Grover, the satyr? This is where Polyphemus realizes Grover is not, in fact, a lady cyclops. Grover thinks quick, telling Polyphemus, that he has a good recipe for eating satyrs and Polyphemus begrudgingly agrees to leave to go and get the ingredients for that, leaving both Clarice and Grover sealed in the cave. There's like a giant boulder sealing the entrance of the cave. They couldn't get down the cliffs. It would have been too difficult. Um, and when Percy and Annabeth tried to move the boulder, they're clearly not strong enough. It's huge. So Annabeth's like, all right, it's time to use trickery. They need Polyphemus to move the boulder to get inside. Um, Annabeth is able to get in invisibly, of course, but Percy has to hold on underneath one of the sheep. It's a good sized sheep, so he's able to hold on underneath and get in that way. So the two are inside and once they are, Annabeth, still invisible, shouts at Polyphemus, calling him ugly. And when he is like, hey, who said that? And it's like, nobody. Immediately Polyphemus is like, nobody, I remember you. Annabeth continues to taunt him. And while this is happening, Percy's able to sneak off and find Grover and Clarice, freeing the two of them. And they're about to leave to get to the ship when they hear Annabeth cry out in fear. Polyphemus shouts that he's got nobody and they get into the cave to see that he is holding up empty air, but when he shakes his fist, 
Annabeth's hat flies off, and there she is in Polyphemus' hand. She's dazed. She has, like, a nasty cut on her forehead. And Percy's like, get back to the ship. I'll deal with this. But they're like, nope, buddy, we are staying. <laughs> so the three of them charge, and Polyphemus drops Annabeth. Great. But he drops her on some rocks. So she's lying on the ground, motionless. <laughs> Percy is taunting Polyphemus, keeping his attention on him while Grover makes his way over to Annabeth. He is able to get her out, and Percy and Clarice follow. They make it across the bridge and start to try and cut it, but it doesn't work. Polyphemus is already on their side of the chasm. Percy begins attacking him, giving the others time to escape, when Polyphemus ends up on the ground and he begins pleading with Percy to spare him. Percy's like, I will if you let us take the fleece and leave, which Polyphemus agrees to. However, the second that Percy is far enough away out of his sword's range, Polyphemus smacks him to the edge of the cliff, and he is about to kill Percy when a boulder sails directly into his mouth. A rock the size of a basketball sailed into Polyphemus' throat, a beautiful three-pointer, nothing but net. The Cyclops choked, trying to swallow the unexpected pill. He staggered backward, but there was no place to stagger. His heel slipped, the edge of the cliff crumbled, and the great Polyphemus made chicken wing motions that did nothing to help him fly as he tumbled into the chasm. I turned, halfway down the path to the beach, standing completely unharmed in the midst of a flock of killer sheep, was an old friend. Bad Polyphemus, Tyson said. Not all Cyclopes are as bad as we look. Tyson's back! He's not dead! Tyson explains what happened how Rainbow, the hippocampus that he had named, found him and a, like he'd been searching for them ever since. Percy is then like, hey Tyson, since the killer sheep don't affect you, can you go and uh, get the fleece for us? He grabs it, throwing it to the others, and the fleece is like super heavy. It's like 60, 70 pounds, but Percy lays it over Annabeth, hoping that it's gonna do what it's supposed to do, but the color slowly returns to her face, and the cut on her forehead starts to close, and she opens her eyes. So, Annabeth is luckily fine. So, the crew begins swimming for the ship when they hear a roar from behind them. Polyphemus is still alive and is charging towards them. Percy and Tyson make a stand, allowing for the others to get Annabeth and the fleece to safety. Polyphemus is taunting Tyson, calling him a traitor to his kind, and Tyson just kind of like stands up for himself. He's like, no, I'm not a traitor and you aren't my kind. The fight is tough, but the two are able to stall him long enough to get to the ship. Clarice is kind of excited. She starts like hollering, but that's enough for Polyphemus to determine where they are on the ship. And he starts throwing boulders at it and the ship starts to sink. Percy wills the ocean to push them far enough away from the wreckage and Tyson calls out for the hippocampi and Rainbow and his friends appear and are able to get them back to Florida. Annabeth quickly runs to a newspaper stand once they're there and figures out that they've been away from camp for 10 days, which means that Thalia's tree is probably almost dead. They need to get the fleece back to camp tonight and they're struggling to figure out what to do when Percy asks Clarice like, hey, what did the Oracle tell you? What was your prophecy? And this is what it was. You shall sail the iron ship with warriors of bone. You shall find what you seek and make it your own. But to spare for your life entombed within stone and fail without friends to fly home alone. Percy immediately figures this out. He's like, Clarice, you need to fly back to New York alone right now. So she agrees, hails a cab, and goes to the airport. However, someone's decided to be relevant to the story once again. Luke. He, they hear his voice from behind them, and Percy's just like... <laughs> It's too late. You already lost the fleece, buddy. We sent it ahead of us. <laughs> and we can just see the realization on Luke's face when he's like, Clarice. And Percy's just like, yep, you got it, buddy. <laughs> so Luke brings them back aboard the Princess Andromeda and Percy spots a fountain spraying mist into the air and he gets an idea. He's got a golden drachma in his pocket and pretends to like throw it at Luke, but instead it goes into the mist. And that's how you send an iris message for anyone that's confused. You throw a girl in drachma 
into like the rainbow mist. Okay, that's how you do it. So he starts yelling at Luke being like, you betrayed everyone, including Dionysus at Camp Half-Blood. Very specifically highlighting those words for the Iris message. There's normally a little blessing that you're supposed to say with it, but he's hoping that this is enough. <laughs> so he then starts asking Luke a bunch of questions, trying to get him to confess to everything out loud, which Luke does since he doesn't know about the Iris message. Luke is getting frustrated though with all these questions because he's like, you already know this. And Percy's finally like, oh, I just wanted the audience to hear and points to the Iris message behind Luke. And we can see Mr. D, Tantalus, and the entire camp listening into this whole conversation. Mr. D is quick to be like, I guess Chiron's not at fault at all. And you know, I do kind of miss the old horse. So he quickly dismisses Tantalus back to the underworld and the Iris message disappears. Luke is pissed, of course, and tells the group that they're, you're not leaving the ship alive, okay? So Percy's like, all right, one-on-one, -on -one, let's go, Luke. And after a while, Luke agrees because he doesn't want to look weak in front of his whole crew. Luke is at a real advantage here. He is better than Percy with a sword. And Percy tries to jump into the pool on the ship to try and like rejuvenate himself and get more energy. But Luke is able to get the upper hand, slicing Percy's leg, and it makes it very difficult for him to stand. And all hope kind of seems to be lost at this point when an arrow sprouts from the mouth of one of Luke's goons and a chorus of war cries can, and hooves can be heard from outside. My mind had trouble processing everything I saw. Chiron was among the crowd, but his relatives were almost nothing like him. There were centaurs with black Arabian stallion bodies, others with gold palomino coats, others with orange and white spots like paint horses. Some more brightly colored t-shirts with day-glow letters that said Party Ponies, South Florida Chapter. Some were armed with bows, some with baseball bats, some with paintball guns. One had his face painted like a Comanche warrior and was waving a large orange styrofoam hand making a big number one. Another was bare chested and painted entirely green. A third had googly eyeglasses with eyeballs bouncing around like on slinky coils in one of those baseball caps with a soda can and straw attachments on either side. They exploded onto the deck with such ferocity and color that for a moment even Luke was stunned. I couldn't tell whether they had come to celebrate or attack. The party ponies are able to cause some mayhem, allowing Chiron to get Annabeth Grover, Tyson, and Percy out of there. Luke's warriors are trying to reorganize themselves after the surprise, but it's too late. The heroes are able to get out of there, leaving Luke in the dust. They get back to the party ponies like main base, and Percy is kind of rather like frustrated over the whole fight. And Chiron's like, we did not have the numbers to take on that many monsters all at once. The conversation then turns to the prophecy and Chiron tells Percy that he can't be sure it's about him. We never know if there's someone out there, it could be someone else. And all you can do at this point is train so that if the time does come and Percy is the kid of the prophecy, he'll be ready. Percy then recalls the three fates, the three old ladies that he saw knitting outside of the bus stop back in the beginning of the first book. And he thinks about the string that he saw them cut and wonders if that was his own lifeline connected to the prophecy. Karen's like, whoa, 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 buddy, don't jump to any conclusions. We don't know what you saw. And Percy's like, well, I am the only child of the big three, so gonna be me. I'm gonna be the one in the prophecy, <laughs> you know? We then learn that Kronos is Chiron's father, which is why he was blamed for Dahlia's tree being poisoned. The party ponies agree to take the heroes back to camp and they get there soon after Clarice. They can apparently travel really fast over long distances as well. We love to see those kind of things. Camp is in rough shape after several monster attacks without the border being able to keep them out, and even the arts and crafts cabin had been burnt to the ground. <laughs> so the moment that Clarice drapes the golden fleece over Thalia's tree, everything seems to just breathe again. Everything starts to regrow, and the needles on the pine tree turn from brown to green. It was a slow process, but there was no doubt that the fleece was working. Clarice gets paraded down to the rest of the camp by her cabin mates, and nobody gives Percy and Annabeth a second glance. 
if they did, they would have to acknowledge that those two snuck out and should probably be expelled. So they can't acknowledge that they were also part of the quest. The next morning, Chiron makes an announcement that kind of shocks everybody. He's like, we're going to continue with the chariot races. Tyson had no interest in being in the chariot again, but Percy and Annabeth were happy to team up with Tyson's help building the chariot. The prize was no chores for the whole month and the two of them trained like crazy over the next couple of days to try and win that prize because who wants to do chores? So the night before the race, Hermes finds Percy once again and Percy's like, I really tried with Luke, but it's no use. And it's absolutely clear that Luke feels as though Hermes abandoned him. Hermes then asks Percy if he feels that way about his dad and Percy just kind of stops for a moment and his immediate thought is, yeah, I do feel that way because of the whole Tyson situation. And the more he thinks about it, the angrier he gets. So Hermes tells Percy that the hardest part about being a god is that they have to act indirectly, especially with their own children. And he's like, Poseidon has been paying attention to you. And it's just through indirect means. He can't physically go up to Percy and be like, hey, here is help. Poseidon has answered Percy's prayers and Hermes just hopes that one day Luke will see that he has done the same for him. He then gives Percy an envelope that he says is from his dad. And when Percy opens it, the paper inside only has two words, brace yourself. Percy is absolutely miserable the next morning because he spent the entire night just like mulling over his father's words. But before the race, Tyson gives him this watch and is like, I'm really sorry this wasn't ready for the quest, but it should protect you if you need it. And Percy is about to apologize for his behavior towards Tyson when Tyson is like, you know, Poseidon did answer my prayers. He had asked Poseidon for a friend and Poseidon sent him Percy. And that was the biggest blessing ever. Mm, so sweet. <laughs> Just so sweet. All right. Race begins, it's going pretty well. Percy is driving, speaking to the horses because that's just a power of Poseidon that he has. He can talk to horses. And Annabeth is defending. So at one point they end up switching spots just as the Hephaestus cabin throws Greek fire onto their chariot, AKA really, really hot green fire. So Percy is like, all right, watch, do your thing. He presses the button on it and suddenly there is a shield on his arm and Percy is able to use that to scoop the fire out and throw it back on the Hephaestus' ch cabin's chariot. So then the duo is able to cross the finish line as victors. Percy's having a pretty good afternoon after this and Grover is like, all right, I'm gonna spend the rest of the summer at camp. I need some time to relax after that horrible thing before I go back out on my little quest. Chiron also finds him and explains to you, Percy that his school is no longer looking for him and no longer blames him for blowing up the gymnasium because they did before. Um, when Percy's like, how in the world did you do that? Chiron's just like, I might have manipulated the mist to persuade them. And he's like, all right, I will teach you how to do that someday. And then he gives Percy a cell phone to call his mom and explain what's going on because Percy just kind of disappeared from school and like didn't come back. So probably should tell his mom what's happening. <laughs> the call goes just about as well as one would expect, but she's just happy that he's okay. And he's like, I could come home for a bit. And she's like, no, 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 stay at camp. You're there now. I'll see you at the end of the summer. So one night Tyson finds Percy and is like, hey, I'm leaving. I'm going to go to our dad's underwater palace and I'm going to like train and be a um, intern at the forges <laughs> essentially with all of the other cyclopses that live down there. Percy's sad of course he's finally starting to like connect with Tyson and feel good about being brothers with him but he's happy that Tyson's getting this opportunity he leaves then and there and Percy stays on the beach for a while before being dragged to dinner by Annabeth and Grover so Percy's dreams are still restless but he is soon awoken by Grover banging on his door two books in a row this man has burst into a place Percy was staying by banging on the door he is very shaken though, and says that something happened to Annabeth. The two of them race out of the cabin, but are soon picked up by Chiron, who takes him up to Thalia's tree, where the fleece is still hanging. Percy is absolutely expecting the fleece to be gone, but it's still there, shockingly. Chiron mutters something about how Kronos has given himself another chance to control the prophecy, 
and Percy sees a girl in Greek armor kneeling next to another girl lying on the ground. He assumes Annabeth's the one lying on the ground since Grover said something happened to her, but he quickly realizes that she's actually the one in the armor. And when Annabeth sees them, she runs up to them and is clearly very shaken by something. Percy kneels down next to the girl on the ground and notices that she has short black hair and freckles and is wearing clothes that is a mix between punk and goth. He knows she's not a camper because he doesn't recognize her, but he has the strangest feeling he's seen her before. Percy is trying to get the others to do something saying she needs nectar or ambrosia, but nobody is moving. They are all too stunned. Then the girl took a shaky breath. She coughed and opened her eyes. Her irises were startlingly blue, electric blue. The girl stared at me in bewilderment, shivering and wild-eyed. Who? I'm Percy, I said. You're safe now. Strangest dream. It's okay. Dying. No, I assured her. You're okay. What's your name? That's when I knew, even before she said it. The girl's blue eyes stared into mine, and I understood what the Golden Fleece quest had been about. The poisoning of the tree. Everything. Cronus had done it to bring another chess piece into play. Another chance to control the prophecy. Even Chiron, Annabeth, and Grover, who should have been celebrating this moment, were too shocked, thinking about what it might mean for the future. And I was holding someone who was destined to be my best friend, or possibly my worst enemy. I am Thalia, the girl said. Daughter of Zeus. And that's where we end it. What a way to end a book. What a way to end the book. I remember reading that for the first time and just being floored. Such a good way to go. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was so fun for me to be able to talk through this book and I am so excited to get into the other ones later on as well. Again, if you don't wanna miss those uploads, please subscribe, turn on post notifications. I would love to see you guys there for the next one. And yeah, I'm just excited to get into it. Um, let me know what your favorite part of this book is in the comments. I love to read through them. And I think that's going to be it. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.